Good evening, everyone. So I just took a few minutes. It's been a while since I've done this, but uh, uh, thanks for joining us on uh, Not the Museum Thursday nights. Uh, sorry, it's uh, I'm on the, I'm on the boards tonight, and I'll probably say this a few times. I apologize. It's been a little while since I've done this, but thanks a lot for joining us uh, for Not the Museum Thursday night our ongoing effort here at the Niagara Falls Museums to continue to provide quality programming at the museums and let you know about what's going on in the city and some interesting uh, projects that we have. And uh, tonight is no exception. Um, very excited to bring you tonight's webinar. I've had the opportunity to work with tonight's presenter a few times. He assisted me when I was curator in Niagara Lake uh, many moons ago, and he helped me develop some exhibitions down there, but we actually never met in person. Um, uh, until this project. And uh, before we get started though, of course, I want to acknowledge that the Niagara region of Ontario is located on the traditional shared territory of the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee and the Chinatown peoples. Chinatown people have called these lands home for thousands of years. And more recently, the Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee have been sharing the land as one dish, one spoon treaty territory. Uh, if you don't know me, my name is Clark Bernard. I'm the uh, Culture and Museums Manager for the city of Niagara Falls. And I'm very happy to bring you tonight's presentation. As I mentioned, I'm running the boards, doing all the tech stuff. I'll be looking at your questions on Facebook, if I did that right, and on Zoom, which I presume I'm doing correctly. And uh, you know, I'm gonna check those things out along the way and doing a bit of a presentation at the front of it, just to let people know a little bit about the exchange and the project that it is. So, uh, so tonight, and, and why I thought this was gonna be an interesting topic that people here would like to see, uh, we are pretty excited about the current project going on in the backyard of the Niagara Falls History Museum. So just out in our backyard, we have a big hole, we have lots of things going on, uh, and it's a really exciting project for the city of Niagara Falls. And I've been working on this project for many years and some time now, and uh, it really became a reality this fall as we broke ground and started the work on this project. And like I said, it's really exciting and something really unique and different for the city of Niagara Falls and the region and really in Ontario. So we're really excited about that. Um, at first tonight, I'm gonna to give a little bit of overview of what the exchange is and what we, we are accomplishing with that project. Um, but the bulk of tonight is going to be dedicated uh, to what is below the ground, what we found when we started digging the holes to build the exchange. And also maybe a little bit about what we didn't find on the property. Um, so to assist uh, the project, uh, so when we started doing the construction, we hired out ASI. Uh, Archaeological Services Incorporated. They, they came in along with reps from the Mississaugas of the Credit. Uh, they're here to observe and record the archaeological material found during the construction. And this is a property, we, we knew archaeology was an important component of what we did here being uh, part of the culture division and part of the museums here. Um, there's a long history on that property. And uh, it's along the traditional trail and route around the falls on the west, west side of Niagara Falls. It's in the middle of a battlefield. It's a location of an early hotel uh, and later a movie theater. And uh, we're, Doug's going to dig into that a little bit later. But uh, um, you know, as he gets in it, he's also going to show what was hidden underneath the soil, what was under the surface, what tells us about those stories, uh, about the theater, about the hotel, and other histories that uh, maybe we didn't expect to see there, and what material culture was found that showcases this history. So it's going to be a really exciting night of what he's going to show. Uh, if you have questions for tonight for either Doug or myself, uh, there is a Q&A feature if you're joining us on Zoom. Uh, ask questions along the way. I probably will leave the questions to the very end. I'll let Doug get through his presentation. Um, and, but it depends on how the night goes and if there's an opportunity to jump in, I uh, might do that as well. There is a chat feature in Zoom. You, you're encouraged to use it. I do, won't be checking there for questions. Um, and also, of course, uh, we're going on Facebook Live. And again, I will attempt to check questions there, but not promising anything. Um, but I will try and get to some of those as well, I'll sort of follow along uh, as Doug is presenting as well through there. But uh, um, we'll see how well that goes. Uh, for sure, I'll be checking the Q&A on the Zoom. Um, so tonight's main presenter, before we sort of throw, I, I sort of get into the, a bit of the exchange, uh, Doug Todd is from Archaeological Services, as I mentioned and very happy uh, that he's gonna join us. And I think you're really gonna enjoy it. Uh, Doug has spent countless years at ASI. He's going on 20 year, 21 years with them. Uh, he's going, done countless work here in Niagara Falls and beyond. Uh, he was a journalist by trade before he got out in with ASI. Uh, himself personally, he's an angler and a painter. So he enjoys uh, uh, spending his spare, spare time uh, 
either in the water or with watercolors, I guess. Um, and, uh, and of course, uh, he's got one of those jobs that a lot of us get fascinated by and uh, are amazed by what archaeologists do. I myself uh, watch archaeologists uh, and see what they do and their knowledge base uh, and the breadth and scope of what they uh, have to be aware of and know about is just fascinating. Uh, their attention to detail is something that's well beyond my uh, scope of talents and abilities. So it's really great to, uh, to be able to talk to an archaeologist really right in the middle of a dig. Uh, most of the work has really been done on the property, but uh, uh, it's still an active construction site and there's still some underground happening. So, so it's great to have them at this stage of it. Usually we sort of wait for reports uh, uh, once the archaeologists get to that. But uh, right now we're sort of uh, uh, really fresh into what he has actually done. So uh, but before we go to him, as I mentioned, I'm going to um, sort of talk a little bit about the, uh, um, the project itself, if I can get to the right page. Bear with me a second. Hang on a second. I don't know if I know what I'm doing. Sure I do. Okay, so there we go. So the exchange itself. So the Niagara Falls Exchange is an exciting project that we have going on in the city. Um, hopefully you're well aware of it and hopefully those who are joining uh, know about the project already. But uh, uh, for those of you who do, I'm just going to do a bit of a gloss over. For those who don't, there's certainly much more that we can get into at some point. Um, and there's lots of different ways you can find out about it. Um, but the project we're talking about basically is the main and ferry area. Um, we're basically uh, you can see the big Bickles hardware store sort of recognized there in this area is a property where the old farmer's market was on this property. And we had a little parquet going there. Uh, as, you, as I mentioned at the top, we're sort of right in the middle of the battlefield. You know, traditionally the Drummond Hill Cemetery and Battlefield Park is sort of seen as, as the main pinnacles of the War of 1812. But we do know that the battle was taking place over much more uh, larger scope of land than, than that was. Uh, and as well as Main Street was the traditional portage route. So a really important section of the city itself. And what we're trying to do is build the exchange, which is a collaborative and creative center for arts and culture in Niagara Falls. Uh, it's really a place where people create, uh, where they share, where they showcase, where they sell, uh, where they come together and have different ideas uh, and talk about it. Uh, it's really a, a space that has um, been a long time coming for this city and offer some great opportunities for the residents of Niagara Falls, uh, for the arts people, for the uh, farmer's market, and a lot of other places. And that's what uh, has been designed. Uh, we work very closely with DTAH, who are architects. Um, we work with them on the consultation phase. We work with them uh, talking to stakeholders. And uh, we really express with them what we really need out of this project and what it needed to be. And uh, this is a view of the market of, uh, of the uh, building itself uh, from Main Street, a bird's eye view. There's the Niagara Falls History Museum right over here in the backyard. Uh, here's Bickles Hardware again here. And this is sort of where the uh, buses exchange on, on Main Street. Um, so it's a great little facility. Um, as I said, we, we hope it becomes, as you see there, it's a vibrant center of activity. That is a place where things are going on, that artists, musicians, food vendors, and lots of different people can come together at different reasons for different times, um, for, for, for music, for the farmer's market, for uh, a workshop, uh, for a lecture, uh, to visit the cafe and lots of different ways that they can come here. And it's, it's really a really unique place. And uh, as I was telling people the other day, again, Niagara Falls, we have a lack of space that is public domain, that is a place for people to come together. And we really feel this is a really unique place for people to come together in Niagara Falls, uh, serving a really unique experience. And as I mentioned before, we had a process working with DTH. We worked with uh, the community. We had lots of feedback from the community. Uh, we worked with the consultants, uh, several different consultants for different reasons. And we had lots of conversations with stakeholders as to what this should be, what this could be, and what this really will be. And, uh, and so what it is, is uh, as you said, there's two sec sections of this building. Uh, the one is the market hall, and this is going to be the home of the Niagara Falls Farmers Market. It's a place to present music, theater, events, and lectures, and a uh, really exciting open space that actually has a lot of acoustic uh, paneling in it um, that, that can enhance uh, any kind of live performance and experience, but also be open, light, and airy um, for 
people who are visiting the market can come and enjoy the markets on Saturdays. And we hope to be adding a night, another, another night to the market as well. Um, and it's really gonna be a wonderful space that has indoor and outdoor space uh, for markets, both our farmer's market and any other markets that we might start putting into this space. And at the interior aspects of the uh, other section of the facility is that it's gonna house our artist studios. It's got a woodworking shop, it's got a cafe, and it's got a gallery. Uh, gallery is an important component. Obviously we've got artists creating and we wanna have a space that they can also showcase what they have going on. So it's really exciting um, space for the, the culture community to come together uh, for the creation side of things. And the woodworking shop will certainly be a membership for all who want to sort of partake in, in doing uh, woodworking activities and exercises and workshops and, uh, or just come in and putter around. So it's a really fun little space that we have going on. And there's just a bit of a bird's eye view as to where we are at. Uh, this was actually taken by our general contractors on Wednesday um, of the overhead. This is sort of that building that has the cafe in the front. Uh, we have washrooms, we have the woodworking shop. Uh, and then the upstairs is the artist studios and the gallery. And then the market hall is this section of the building. And as I mentioned, this is where uh, the museum is and Main Street's just up to the top here. So that's sort of where we're at at this stage. The foundations are in, the floors are going in slowly and uh, it's really moving along. And there's a shot from the ground. Uh, I think this I took yesterday uh, when I was out there. So again, sort of showing the uh, a ground level view of the property. and and sort of all these holes are where uh, Doug's gonna be talking about a little bit later. And again, another shot facing Main Street as well. So, so that's where we're at. The project, as I mentioned, has started. The walls are, uh, for the basements are complete, as you just saw. A lot of the underground work is done. Uh, we're hoping to take possession in May of next year. So we're about a year out from taking possession. And of course, hopefully have the place up and running or at least in, in some capacity uh, by June of next year. So that's sort of where we're at at this stage of the project. And right now, obviously a lot of our work, we got a year to go. Uh, we've got to reach out to partners and see who else can be using this site. And we've been having regular meetings with people to see who, uh, who else can sort of utilize this space and this property uh, for great things and fun things. Um, we're developing the policies, all the fun stuff that I get to do on the administration side, policies, rates and fees and all that. And of course, we'll be putting out an RFP for the cafe at some point as well um, to, to put out that. And just today we put out the RFP for a piece of public art out the front. So it's exciting times. There's a lot of behind the scenes while the construction is going on. And if you wanna follow what's going on uh, at the exchange, uh, NiagaraFallsExchange.ca has some, some information. It has a webcam on the property. Our Let's Talk Niagara Falls page also has more details and I try and update that page every two weeks to let people know how the project's going. Uh, as I mentioned, we've got a webcam on the site that you can follow at both those pages. And of course, Niagara Falls Exchange or the NFX has Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, whatever your preferred choice of uh, social media is. So that's what we've got going on. Like I said, it's a really exciting space. You know, this view here shows the great outdoor space we have. We've got great indoor space, and it's a really interesting place that we have uh, coming together. But that's not really why we're here tonight. Uh, we, uh, we were here to uh, um, talk about the archeology span and what was underneath the ground. So I'm gonna sort of stop there. I'm gonna sort of ask Doug to sort of un, uh, mute himself, unmute himself and uh, join us. Go. And uh, Doug, uh, welcome and thank you How very you much doing? for joining us. Thank you very um, much. Doug is gonna to continue to be a man, a man of mystery. He uh, doesn't have a camera on his computer, but he's got pretty pictures to show. So. Um, that's how we're going to go out tonight. I'm going to sort of share that screen with everybody and, and basically throw it over to you, Doug, as soon as I get to that piece. All righty. Thank you very much, Clark. Thanks a lot. There we go. Hello, everyone. Thanks for dropping by and checking out, uh, being a part of my presentation. Um, I hope you have a comfy chair and, uh, you're comfortable and happy and healthy. Um, so let's start. I'm an archaeologist with ASI, Archaeological Services Inc. out of Toronto, though I live smack dab in the middle of the uh, Niagara Peninsula. And our company was retained back in 2017 um, to begin uh, work, so to speak, in research on the subject property, what I will call the subject property, this um, unique piece of property on Main Street in Niagara Falls, uh, bordered by Main Street and Sylvia Place to the east. 
Um, but our research, uh, it's, it was ve very cool what was unco in, uncovered in the process of doing research on this piece of property. It really breathed life into the area, um, into an area that really, you know, to any passerby just looks like your typical urban scene. Um, we did a series of trenches, uh, was it two years ago, to ascertain what the stratigraphy looked like, generally speaking, over the property. And um, of course, it was obvious that the subject property had been heavily impacted by 200 odd years of uh, development and disturbance, right? That's typical for, you know, an Ontario downtown, but there was still some cool stuff in place. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight. So I arrived on the scene in January, um, yes, the middle of the cold Canadian winter, to uh, begin a series of monitoring uh, visits to the site. So as the soils were impacted by construction, I, um, I wanted to be there the day when this was occurring to see what would be possibly revealed by the, the heavy equipment. Because we had done a series of two reports in stage one and stage two work previously, to you know, you know, determine the uh, archaeological value of the property, it was now agreed by all parties and the Ministry of Culture that monitoring could now take place, and uh, that was the purpose of my 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 stay over the course of a few months down there. Now, I want to say one thing, and what I'm about to say is probably the most important thing I'm going to say tonight, is that we have to remember that you know before the Europeans showed up in Niagara in the 17th century that there were already people living here, right? There were people living here, loving, laughing. You know, they were, they were living on the property and surrounding areas. We have to always remember that. I know a lot of history books begin with, you know, in 1750, the farmer from Pennsylvania, but no. This land, surrounding lands, the whole province, the whole country, basically, as we all know, really, right? Uh, was populated by people for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. My work, my forte is the analysis of stone tools. That's my forte in archaeology and the debris you create when you make the stone tool. So each day, I am more or less blessed and honored to be able to study those stone tools created that so long ago. So again, when we're talking about the subject property, yes, it has a unique history over 230 years, but let's not forget that that's not where the history starts. The history starts literally more than 11,000 years ago. So let's, yeah, we just have to remember that. We have to honor that and remember that it's very important. So let's begin. Uh, can I have slide two there, Clark, please? And there, of course, is uh, yeah the beautiful structure that is being built today. And, and isn't it refreshing that something cultural is being constructed, um, not only during the height of a pandemic, but just being constructed in general. That's, uh, that's incredible. Um, so the area literally sits on ground zero of what was the Battle of Lundy's Lane site, right? The, L the Battle of Lundy's Lane from the War of 1812. Um, it was a bloody night that July 25th, 1814, day and night. It was just, uh, it's called one of the most horrendous battles of the War of 1812. It was so, so bloody. We'll go into some detail in a moment. So I was there, of course, to monitor to see if anything from the battle came to light. And I've done that on other battlefield sites, and there's been some cool finds. So that's my, my reason for there uh, for the past few months. So we're talking now of the old uh, township of Stamford, really, that would encompass this area. And the area that um, what is now is, uh, is, uh, is in Ontario was purchased by the Crown in a treaty called uh, the Treaty of Fort Niagara in 1764. This was a treaty by 24 nations that were part of the seven nations of Canada and the Western Lakes Confederacy. And the treaty transferred possession of a two mile strip of land bordering the east side and the west side of the Niagara River. And it was to allow the movement of troops and goods in this corridor. Primarily, they had the uh, Portage Road, right, was actually an ancient portage from Queenston Heights, Queenston, Ontario, at the Niagara River to transfer port goods around Niagara Falls up to Fort Erie, up to Lake Erie, or vice versa, right? Lots of furs, lots of goods, especially furs coming northbound. Uh, the remainder of the Stanford Township, it was acquired by the British from the Mississauga Nation in 1784. And that was ratified, of course, at Newark's uh, Navy Hall, today's Niagara Lake. That was in 1792. 
Now, by the 1840s, half of the privately owned land in the township was under cultivation, orchards, vegetables, and had a population of 2,500. It was just described as one resident as being old and well settled, containing good land and beautifully situated farms. So there you go. That was in the 1840s. Now, by the 1790s, again, back to the portage, the bustling crossroads of today's Lundy's Lane and Main Street was known as Drummondville, or simply called the Big Sand Hill for obvious reasons, right? It's a very large deposit of sand uh, deposited post uh, by the glaciers. And again, ancient Lake Warren played, uh, played a role in its creation as well. That's 12, 13,000 years ago. So if you can imagine this for 30 years, basically, the uh, Portage Road and right in front of our subject property, it was a really bustling, busy area. You had these teams of oxen and wagons and horses and teamsters going up and down that road constantly 24 seven, taking goods either way back to Queenston or from Queenston to Fort Erie. Like it was a very cool and busy little hamlet. You can just picture it, a mud road, all these teams of horses and oxen, people yelling, the teamsters yelling, a couple of taverns to house the uh, teamsters through their half, you know, maybe on halfway of their journey. It was a, a very cool little location. Um, and another sound, so beside the sound, it's very cool what you came across, beside the sound of all that commotion going on, uh, one visitor at the time to Drummondville, I think this was about 18, just after the war, or it might have been before the war, he called it a pleasant looking village and what would be an agreeable piece of place of residence were it not for the continuous monotonous rumbling sound of the cataract. And he further states it resembles the noise of some huge spinning mill, but no doubt the residents after some time get accustomed to it and don't, and don't notice it. So you can imagine there were no buildings from the cataract from the falls to Drummondville to muffle the sound. And so living right there on the subject property or by it or around it, you would have heard 24 seven again, that rumble of the falls. And to a visitor, it seemed like, how can you live here? It's such a, a noise is being created. It almost sounds like, um, you know, the windmills that we're putting up today, right? People complain of that sound 24 seven, just reminding me of that in a modern context. So let's talk about the war, the uh, elephant in the living room. Now I've worked down there. Hmm off and on for the last 20 odd years up at Freilich Tavern, um, which would be just across from the church, right on the peak of land where the main fighting took place. I was digging around there a few times. I've dug in the cemetery and this is the first time I've been on the Eastern uh, flank, if you will, of the battlefield. And again, it dates to July 25th, 1814. That's when the nightmare clash occurred between British forces, First Nation fighters, local militias, and the American forces. And it was often hand to hand, and it really centered around, which is basically a stone throw or a musket throw from um, our subject area. Thank you. So you can see that slide there. If you could check out, see Ripley's 23rd US Infantry, where they were basically stationed before the battle right in there. That is the subject area. So you've got woods, you've got swamp, and yeah, so you had a bunch of uh, hundreds of Americans sitting right on that, on our subject property, subject area, waiting to um, to storm that height of land there where the church is. It's it's actually when you think about it, when you think about what happened then on that day, it's incredible. I mean, we take it for granted, right? That and if we even think about it, but um, I know everybody here is obviously interested in history. But what happened that day? It's just it's unbelievable what occurred. Now let's um, go on with the war. So it, it, it resulted on the British side in 85 men being, uh, being killed and 500 wounded. The Americans lost 175 men and they had hundreds. I think it was over 500 that were wounded. Uh, there are a lot of interesting characters that day of the battle. Uh, the Mohawk leader, John Norton was there. Um, American General Winfield Scott was there. Now this is a, a very interesting guy, Winfield Scott. Now he was literally right there. So he possibly walked across the, the subject property. This guy was in the Battle of York in Toronto. He helped burn Toronto to the ground, York to the ground, sacked the Parliament buildings, burned it. Um, he was there with Zubalon Pike, you know, Pike's Peak in the United States. 
Pike was killed in Toronto when the Fort York exploded, that mysterious magazine explosion. It killed Pike, actually. Um, the Americans next stormed the beaches, literally, in Niagara Lake, Newark, and they took Niagara Lake, burned it to the ground a few months later in the middle of winter, uh, 400 residents looking at each other. Okay, now what do we do? I mean, this, this Scott guy was injured there. He shows up at all the major Niagara battles, and he shows up here, obviously, at Lundy's Lane battle leading uh, the Americans. Now, just a quick note, Scott vanishes from history after the war. He's still in the military. He resurfaces in 1860, helping lead the Union forces for Abraham Lincoln. This guy was unbelievable. His, his name by then was, and basically he was in his late 70s and he was an alcoholic. His nickname was Old Fuss and Feathers. It's an incredible story. And this guy is, was in Niagara Falls fighting when he was 20 something. I mean, it's just a very cool story. Just gives you a little snapshot of who took place, what took place in that battle. It was a, a human engagement that was bloody. And also there, of course, was William Hamilton Merritt, right? The father of the Welland Canal. He was there leading the, I think it was the second militia, Lincoln militia um, from Lincoln County. He was actually captured at that battle. And our, uh, you know, our great um, William Hamilton Merritt uh, was sent to prison in near Boston, Massachusetts. And he was released in 1815. And I believe, I actually have a colleague at work, and he is her great, 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 great grandfather. He basically walked back from Massachusetts, if I remember, to St. Catharines to then, you know, sit on to life and uh, ultimately build a well and canal. Um, it's a really incredible story. When you put names on the people that were there, the Scots that were there, I mean, there were people killed there that had knew nothing about Niagara and their families back in Edinburgh, Scotland or London, England, would not get word for quite a while that their son or brother was killed on this battlefield in, in what would become Niagara Falls. It's, it's amazing. So um, the research that we did at the time, stage one is stage two. Uh, yeah, it obviously showed, right, that this is an important piece of property and it could have remnants, uh, archeologically speaking, of archeological value. And there are examples of soldiers being unearthed um, after the war, well after the war. The digging, uh, one example is di the digging of Mary Skinner's grave in D Drummondville Cemetery in 1899. While digging her grave, they unearthed nine American soldiers. And in 1891, 11 British soldiers were unearthed at the sand quarry behind Freilich Tavern. It uh, sadly was a uh, sand quarry in the uh, late 18th century extracting of sand and of course a lot of evidence of the war was taken uh, away by that uh, again in the 1890s three british royal scots uh, my grandfather was a royal scot three british uh, uh, royal scots were unearthed and um one eyewitness a Kathner, a catherine buckner you know behind the cemetery is a little street called buckner and she recalled uh during the battle that the british pulled up after the battle the british pulled up her father's farm posts her whole wooden fence surrounding their farm and use that wood to create a pyre to burn the American dead. And that was in the Southwest corner of the present church. So, you know, there's a lot, uh, there's obviously a lot still underground waiting to be recovered that um, originates from that incredible battle. I can have slide four, here we go. Clark's on the ball, thank you very much, sir. Um, so when did the first European settle on our piece of property? If you can see there, uh, Forsyth, right smack dab in the middle of the screen, possibly we have Forsyth, Forsyth just below that, and then Mr. Millier. That's basically the study area. Now, Forsyth was a Scot, and Milliard was born in Connecticut. And of course, both men were loyalists to the Crown. They left New York during the Amer American Revolutionary War, and they came to Upper Canada and gr were granted this land. Uh, Milliard, in fact, he was a Butler's Ranger. So we're all in this area familiar with Butler's Rangers. Milliard was a Butler Ranger and um, did a lot of fighting during the Revolutionary War. And a brick house was built by Forsyth in 1798. Believe it or not, it still stands to this day at 6103 Culp Street. His brick home, which was later a tavern and a hotel, um, I believe during the war, actually, officers from both sides frequented this brick structure and it is still there today luckily and happily 
Uh, a cool little story is Forsyth's son, William, was jailed at the time on suspicion of arson. And he was sent to prison. And William escaped. He, he, he got out of prison and his dad helped him to try to get to the US. Now, the arson that he was said to have committed was he burned a hay barrack in Queenston, Ontario that belonged to none other, if you're familiar with this name, Robert Hamilton. He was the huge, huge wealthy uh, mover and shaker in Niagara. He basically owned the whole Niagara. <laughs> this guy owned a ton of land in Niagara. He basically owned a lot of the Niagara Peninsula. And he later became a famous judge, you know, local politician. The guy was, the guy was a mover and shaker for sure. But William is, um, he was accused of burning down this gentleman's hay barrack. So you're not going to, I think if you're caught doing that or said to do that, you're, you're, you're pretty well toast. Um, what happened was later on, William and his father were caught in Fort Erie. His dad was driving the wagon at full speed with William in it, trying to get away from government troops who captured them. Uh, and incredibly also William, this bad boy William, was an ensign in the second Lincoln Artillery Company. And it's likely he fought, he fought at Lundy's Lane. So here's this character who basically fought across the street or even on his own property. Like it's, it's just a, it's, it's a very cool story. Uh, William went on to ho own a hotel in Niagara Falls. And ironically, I guess the hotel burned to the ground in, in 1839. So there you go. Uh, slide five, please, Clark. There we go. Look at that. Hey, eh? look at that. That's the Kick Hotel. Wouldn't you like to put your feet up after a day of visiting the falls and just relax at the Kick Hotel? It's a beautiful structure. Um, there's a trolley there, and it's a trolley being pulled by horses. So that's a very early photo. Um, so what we find through our research is that from the late 1700s, probably up till 1860, a lot of the land, the subject property was under cultivation and was um, orchard. The majority of it was orchard or a fringe of a forest. And it wasn't until 1860 when a Bavarian by the name of Michael Kick uh, built the Kick Hotel. I think it was also called at one point the International Hotel. But he built it on Front Street. You can see there it's basically um, sitting right in front of right on, on top of uh, of, of Main Street, sorry, on Main Street. Um, now, Michael died in 1874. So about 14, 15 years later, he died, at which point his wife, Mary, took over. Mary sadly died of heart failure in 1914, and her sons struggled to run the hotel. Uh, they missed a mortgage payments in 1917, and they lost the business. This beautiful hotel uh, caught fire in 1920, and... Um, then becomes its uh, other use shortly. The, the, all the kicks are interred at Drummond uh, Hill uh, Cemetery. And just a, a quick little quote. It was said of Mary at the time of her death that she was one of the finest women, kind-hearted, a good mother. When she kept the hotel, she was kind to the poor and she was good to our firemen getting up suppers. She worked hard all her lifetime. Isn't that great? That's a little quote from somebody um, at her burial. Uh, slide six, there we go. So. We're now jettison up towards, uh, we're in the year 1923, when the Webb Theater on the left was developed on the property, which uh, was once home to the Kick Hotel. Um, now the Webb was renamed the Hollywood Theater in 1931. And you can see on the right side, the uh, version of the theater known as the Hollywood. And then ultimately this famous landmark became the Princess theater in 1956. Now it ceased, ceased uh, to be in operation in 1978 and then it became the Canadian Serbian Cultural Center and it was purchased by the city of Niagara Falls in 2012 and then uh, demolished. So there are just a couple uh, little stories of who owned land, what happened on land over 200 years and um, Again, it appears that much of it was an orchard for a lot of the time until the Kick Hotel came into being. And there were some small structures behind the museum that were, you know, not permanent uh, storage shed or I know behind the museum, which was the town hall at the time, there were some, uh, I think there was a police, a, a small police station and a, the firemen used to hung their, the hoses from a structure behind the town hall, behind the museum. Um, 
and then in the 1920s, a lot of the area was turned into a auto parking lot. And of course, in the 1980s, we had the farmer's market structures come to the property. And then you throw in the crisscrossing placement of underground services right over the 20th century. You've got a lot, lot, of, lot of disturbance going on there. Um, that doesn't mean the archaeology is obliterated, of course. It just, uh, yeah, it's, it's been heavily, um, heavily used and abused, and, uh, but there's still that, um, still that potential. So the sad part that uh, after 230 years of European occupation, and again, all the, uh, the changes to the, to the land itself and the, the Battle of Lundy's Lane did not reveal itself. Um, the two centuries of farming development, heavy evidence of the Great Battle are either long gone or they were never present in the first place. But however, despite that, there was some cool archeology span yet to, uh, yet to come. So if we can go to slide number seven, please, sir. There we go. Sorry about that, having some technical. Yeah, that's cool. Problem. There we go. There we go. So check that map out. That dates to the 19th century. And you can see smack dab in the middle again, you see the Kicks Hotel, right? This map is probably 1860s and you can see Portage Road. I'm used to saying Portage, but I know it's Portage, Portage Road. And you can see the Kicks Hotel there. And you can see just up to the Northeast, you see the town hall, which is today's museum. And of course, uh, the subject property is that L-shaped land that's um, between the two structures there. That's a very cool map. Um, slide eight, if I could, Clark. These are a series of other maps that just uh, are going to show what was on the subject property over the course of time. So here you have a 1913 city plan. And again, you see in the lower, lower left hand corner there, there's the Kick, uh, the Kicks Hotel. So from the photograph, if you remember, it had a beautiful, beautiful hotel in front. And there's those three buildings in the back that are, are interesting. And again, you've got a, you have um, what is called a drive shed in the back there, another large storage shed, I guess. And if you head up towards the town hall there in the museum, there's a couple of small structures, um, but basically not uh, a lot of heavy use in what would have been agricultural land and is soon to become in the 20s um, portions of an auto uh, parking lot. We have slide nine, please. We have a city plan from 1932. And again, you can see down the left hand corner, the Hollywood Moving Picture Theater. Uh, up in the right hand top corner there, you see the Township Hall, Masonic Hall, and a couple of little structures, a tower, there's a 60 foot tower there to hang uh, fireman hoses, that sort of thing. Again, very light use. Um, but that's uh, 1932. Now, if we have slide number 10, please, Clark, there's an aerial view of uh, 2015. You see that in the middle there, the uh, green space, little parkette created, and then you've got the parking lot behind it, and then you have the structure for the farmer's market there before you uh, again go up to the hotel. And slide 11, please. So here's typical uh, stratigraphy, if you want to call it, uh, which would have been it's back off Main Street, maybe 20 meters or so, where the wall of the, where the west wall of the Niagara Falls Exchange will be. Now you can see by this, it's interesting because what you see here up in the top there, and I think that Sam standing up there, you can see a layer of clay, concrete chunks, imported clays, you know, brought up to lift the land up. There's no sign of a topsoil. And then you go immediately to that gorgeous, beautiful uh, sand, why it's called Big Sand Hill, that beautiful glacially deposit, that moraine, that beautiful, that sand goes on forever. It's just a beautiful sand. And you can see why up the street behind Frolic's Tavern, why that sand was being um, basically mined for a construction purpose and that it's a, a beautiful, clean sand. Um, slide 12, please, Clark. So what is this? Looks like something out of Space Odyssey, but what it is, in fact, it's the web theater. It's the basement. Um, it's the east wall of the basement of the web theater. 
and there's evidence that it was bricked up at one time. Um, the portion of the bottom of the doorway is bricked. So I imagine it was an exterior door. You maybe went up a stairway to get up and go down to this door. And for whatever reason, they chose to uh, brick it up at some point in, um, in history. So that's a concrete wall, east wall, below grade of the web theater, uh, 1920s. Uh, slide 13, Clark, please. Oh, what's this? Hmm. So what you have here is yeah, your classic brick chimney. And again, it was on the south side of the web theater. It's a special brick that can be vitrified. And there's the vitrified con contents. A lot of metal bits and bobs in there. Um, just a remnant. Again, a lot of uh, construction has gone on here, right? I mean, afterwards um, um, with different walls and foundations, but that's a remnant of the chimney from the web theater. And if we could have slide uh, 14, please, sir. So this was an interesting. This is, um, it was uh, torn into over the, uh, over the decades, but this is uh, originally a, a stone well made of, um, either field stone, those are dolomite limestone cobbles, dry construction, you know, no mortar used. Uh, and it went down approximately 20 feet. Now, what this would have been was the water source originally for the uh, Kick Hotel, likely constructed under uh, Michael's orders. Um, it's, it's interesting that Usually these type of wells in archaeology, they hold, you know, everything and any, anything went into a well, right? I mean, there's been some spectacular finds and finds that can help date the structure, of course. Uh, I was surprised how clean this well was. I mean, there were bottles in it that gave you a hint uh, as its time of disuse, when it went under, uh, went into disuse. But um, the bottles dated to approximately, I would say the 18... 70s or 80s, probably the eight, be safe to say the 1890s. That's when the this well was uh, stopped being used for whatever reasons, and I'll, we'll see what uh, the Kick Hotel used uh, shortly. Um, let's see if we could go to slide 15, please. There we go. And yes, we uh, used a Timmy cup for scale. I believe that's a large double double, if I'm not correct. And that is what that is is a disc made of oak one inch thick, somebody actually created a beautiful round disc and placed it at the bottom of the well. I've never seen it before. They were quite, uh, they had a, 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 the wood floor of the stone well. Um, and again, it's, they're usually filled with trash. This did have some trash. This did hold some bottles. Uh, and again, the bottles date to uh, the 1870s, 1890s, when I believe this well stopped being used. You know, who knows the reasons for that. And we'll see on slide 16, here is what, now this is gonna be interesting, it's interesting. Um, this is what will be the north wall of the exchange. So where do we start here? This is a cistern made of brick that was, I believe, constructed for the Kick Hotel after they stopped using the stone well. Now there's a lot going on here. You see Woody there standing to the right. Um, it's basically a seven or eight foot structure made of brick oval. I, I'll show you a diagram in a moment, but if you can see in the top, in both photographs, in the top right hand corner, there's the top of the cistern and then heavily impacted by these concrete foundations. So the cistern did its job, it existed in history, and then somebody came along and poured these massive, massive concrete foundations right on top. So of course, when you're digging down to place these foundations, you're obviously, they're obviously hit some brick, right? They obviously, oh, we found some brick, <laughs> but they poured these incredibly heavy um, concrete. I believe that's from the 1980s. We'll, we'll show you some more of that in a minute. But um, this brick cistern, if we can go to slide um, 17, please, sir. Now here is a diagram taken from, uh, it represents a cistern that was, I believe in North Carolina, but it's exactly what this cistern would have been. Um, it was lined with plaster, which is pretty cool. And it was used to obviously retain rainwater, right? Um, ours had some portal entryways at the top where rainwater could come in and fill this cistern. And instead of using that well water, right? From that stone well, 
you now have a, a beautifully uh, clay clay made uh, cistern where you could draw your clean water from. Um, typically, sometimes these cisterns would have a brick wall in the middle of them, and that brick wall acted as a filter. The rainwater would pass through the brick wall and actually filter the water. That's quite unique. I mean, this had showed no signs of that, but um, it's a very cool structure. Again, it was heavily impacted over the decades, but there's enough left to say, hey, that's that's pretty cool. And again, it's tied to the uh, Kick Hotel. If we can go to slide 18, please. Now, again, there, there were a lot of bottles in the cistern. They dated from the 1890s to um, 1905. And uh, we've got some cool stories coming up on, on some of what was found in that cistern. But you can see here again, uh, that would be the upper uh, right hand side of the cistern in the left photo. And that massive concrete that, you know, that 1980s concrete sitting right on top of it. And uh, right hand, you can see a portion of the wall. And again, it was lined with plaster. A lot of, uh, you know, very detailed work was put into producing the structure to produce, uh, to have fresh rainwater available to the people that stayed at the, uh, at the Kick Hotel. All righty, let's see what else we got here. So this, doesn't that look horrifying? <laughs> when, it was, when it first came to light, I thought, what is going on here? So there's a load, this was a load of clothing, obviously. Um, and I'm thinking, why, what is going on here? So as the soils were peeled away, it was shown that, uh, and you can see just a little bit on the left there, again, that massive beam that's heading for the cistern. In the construction trench of this concrete foundation built in the 80s, somebody, for some reason, dumped a load of clothing into the construction trench. And it's easy to date the clothing because in the clothing was a mug celebrating Christmas 1984. There were some hostess bags, which now I know take more than 50 years to disintegrate. And there was a bag, if you remember Robinson's department store, there was a bag from Robinson's department store. There was one at the Penn Center at one time back in the day, and it was tied into a knot. And I believe it was, I think it was Matt. Yeah, the Mississauga, the credit uh, First Nation. He opened the bag up and it was full of um, interesting costume jewelry from the time. But uh, I don't know what the story is there, but somebody felt, hey, we got an open construction trench after pouring this concrete foundation, let's throw a lot of clothing into it. Yeah, quite, uh, quite bizarre, quite bizarre. Uh, we have slide 20, there we go, look at this, this is, this is pretty cool. So in laying a line for, um, I believe it was, it was a water line. Um, you can see the stratigraphy there. So Josh on the uh, front end, on the, uh, on the loader there, he took away the, at the top, he took away the concrete and the gravel. Then he exposed a heavy um, clay uh, layer that was full of uh, brick and glass. And, you know, now whether it was heavily disturbed or imported or brought in or shoved around, I mean, it was just a, a classic heavily, uh, heavily um, contaminated uh, clay layer. And then just below that, in the sand, in the Lundy's Lane sand, was a, a beautiful little 1920s, early 1930s uh, rubbish, rubbish dump, trash heap. If you can picture, take away the gravel, take away the all that that construction matter on the top. You can even take away that clay, right? Whenever that was brought in, and you would have had a, a thin soil, a, top, a thin layer top soil. Somebody dug a hole. And they must have left it open for quite a time because uh, there's quite a lot of, of artifacts in there dating to that period. But they just dumped their stuff, right? They dumped, dumped a lot of ash from their fire. They dumped a lot of their broken household goods, which we'll get into. It's a, it's a unique little time capsule, really. Um, it really reveals a lot about, uh, about that time. There was dinnerware. There were cow and pig bones. There's miscellaneous metal. Um, yeah, it's quite interesting. And again, it's post-Great War. Um, and by what the uh, artifacts within this dump dates to about the 20s into the 30s. If we could have slide 21, I think we have another shot of it. Yeah, it's just, um, it was so rich. 
it's hundred year old artifacts, right? There was everything in there from, uh, you know, dad's um, steak to mom's cooking ware. Um, there was anything and everything. I'm going to show you some photos of the unique artifacts that were found within this uh, within this feature. If we could have slide 22, please, sir. So this just shows a typical shot of the services going to the ground. You see in the background there behind Josh, there's Sam there in the trench. You see the museum, the former town hall, and um, that's a water line being laid parallel to Sylvian Place. A lot of disturbed soil in there, a lot of imported clays, a lot of that beautiful, again, Lundy's Lane um, sand. And let's see slide 23, please. Again, that's more typical excavation shots. That's Sam again. Um, yeah, you can see all that construction stuff that was brought in, gravels and crushed gravels and of all the assorted sizes. And it's basically, there's a clay layer there that was brought in, shoved around. And then you have, again, that sterile, uh, sterile sand. And slide 24. So look at these beautiful bottles. Um, so as a kid, I, I dug bottles all across North Niagara, I, I don't know, 13, 14, up to maybe I was 16, 17, maybe to an age where you couldn't crawl around anymore in people's backyards and, and dig up their property. Um, but I did this with a couple of friends. And so when these bottles started to reveal themselves, right, I was like, oh, okay. I was, went back to my childhood. Here you see uh, some, some really nice uh, beer and soda bottles. And they, again, they helped to date the, uh, the Kick Hotel cistern. They were all found within that, um, that cistern, which, which I think the cistern, it looks like it came into disuse around the Great War period. Because once the cistern was done, then they started to throw this uh, stuff in there. It, it may have been disused around 1910, but you see a bottle here from the Cromweller and White Brewing Company of Port Coburn. That's a very cool brewery that moved to Welland later on. A very cool story associated with that. And on the right, um, the famous Niagara Falls Bottling Works uh, bottles, which are quite common and popular. There's different shades of those. Um, and again, I found that as a child. And uh, here they are at the, at the site. Now, slide 25. These are beautiful. I mean, look at these. These are, these are gorgeous uh, series of um, you know, wine, alcohol bottles. Uh, beer bottles. Interesting thing is that the green bottle, uh, third from the left, that uh, originates from a brewery in New Zealand, Cromwell, Cromwell Brewery in New Zealand. So how, what story that has to say of how it got to, uh, to the subject property from New Zealand is uh, intriguing. It's, it dates to a begin about 1910 or so. Um, slide 26, please. Look at that, that's gorgeous. That's over ooh, 20 inches tall, but um, yeah, it's missing its top. But it's from the Wilnecott uh, Company uh, Clay Works in England, Tamworth, England. And it was produced in the 1860s or 70s. This was found in that old uh, stone well at the bottom of the stone well. And it, um, yeah, it dates to about the 1860s, 1870s. Gorgeous piece of ceramic, missing its top or not. Beautiful. Um, slide 27. There's again a, just a, a beautiful piece of of crockery that was used for every day, right? Um, either had pickles in it or whatever. But look at a lot of work went into the producing that. Isn't that cool? We just don't see that obviously today. That's it's just beautiful, beautiful piece of crockery. Slide twenty eight. This is cool. Uh, this is over, I believe it's over two feet tall, and it's intact, which is quite rare, obviously, right? It's uh, could easily be smashed. Now this was found on a day when Josh was digging a trench and it literally popped out of a wall and rolled at the feet of Matt. And there you have it, this beautiful whiskey. It would have had a paper label on it and it would have had some, um, I don't know if quality whiskey was in there, but certainly whiskey, but isn't that the coolest thing? That jug uh, would have been used in the uh, Kick Hotel. So Mary may have held that handle uh, her sons may have held that handle and poured, you know, the tired uh, tourists. Uh, after a long day of checking out the uh, falls, he wanted to have a little, little shot of whiskey, and there you go. It came in that incredibly beautiful container. Uh, slide 29. We have some beautiful whiskey and gin bottles. Again, um, late 1890s, uh, post, you know, pre pre Great War. Um, that helped to date the uh, cistern. And slide 30. 
these are cool. These are very cool. These are medicine bottles that were made for Alan Thorburn. So, I mean, if you're from Niagara Falls, right? Thorburns is quite a, a famous name in town. It's a drug store. It went, went on to be, I believe it was three other locations, but this main location was a stone's throw again from the subject property. It was on the corner, I guess it would be the Southwest corner of Lundy's Lane and Main Street. That's where Alan Thorburn, originally from Cayuga, uh, built his, um, his beautiful drug store. And uh, yeah, did business up till, I believe the early 1990s that Thorburn was, was around for. And these bottles again, uh, come from the uh, cistern, all the garbage rubbish that was thrown into the cistern after its use. Now, interestingly, these bottles likely held a light syrup, right, for, for coughs and colds and, and that sort of thing. So somebody in New York, uh, sorry, in the Kick Hotel um, had a cold or whatever, and they went, walked over to Thorburn's, just kitty corner to the site, came back, and they had their, their wonderful medicine to get better. Now, during this time, especially in the States, there was a really terrible thing going on. And of course, we've all heard of it, right? Uh, the sale of snake oil um, from about the 1870s till 1910. Uh, over 50,000, there were over 50,000 questionable products that were termed uh, snake oil. And they were flying off the shelves. They were flying off the shelf. Why were they flying off the shelves? Well, the ingredients right, were very addictive. That was the problem. Um, I think in 1905 alone, in today's dollars, these manufacturers made $2 billion. So a lot of people became addicted by, um, especially in the United States, by these snake oil, these wonder ointments, these remedies, these cures, right? They had everything in them from alcohol. Mostly they were alcohol, chloroform, opiates, cannabis. I mean, you know, you, you crack one bottle of that and you get hooked very quickly. And um, sadly, many deaths were blamed on um, the addictive ingredients in these snake oil bottles. Uh, there's reports of many, many, many people falling into the machinery at work uh, at the turn of the century because they were addicted to this. They went to work and of course they ended up falling into the machinery. Um, Steam train engineers were hallucinating, it caused a lot of the addiction to this, uh, these snake oils, um, uh, resulted in a lot of train wrecks. The women's temperance movement groups in the early part of the century tried to, uh, tried to ban uh, snake oils. And it wasn't until 1905 when the American government started to uh, the ban the mailing of them um, and the use of the word cure. So of course, okay, I have to use, stop using the word cure, but now I, I can use the word remedy which a lot went on to use um, remedy. Uh, again, these, uh, the Canadian um, early drugs at the time, like these bottled ointments were usually light syrups, not for coughs and colds and gripe and that sort of thing. But especially so in the States, it was a huge, like New York City, Chicago, the big, the big centers. It was, you're basically, you know, you're making these drinks and hooking these people. And uh, it was a, a terrible problem. In 1908, Canada, um, got into action and started to uh, mirror some of the actions taken by the states to, to stop their selling. Um, slide, uh, there, you want. There, there it is there. There's uh, Thorburn's Drugstore, right on the corner of Main Portage and um, Lundy's Lane. And that structure is still there today, right? It, it's being used by, uh, it's now a pawnbroker, but that structure is still there. The little structure next to it is still there. I was looking at the beautiful stonework on the roof there the other day actually it's just gorgeous and there it's still there today um and look at all this telephone pole i love telephone i paint and i love telephone poles and in this one photo i mean you got four or five uh telephone pole there's a police station there in the back um the police station was at the back of the pharmacy i guess that stopped robberies didn't you have your own uh, police force in the back um if we could have slide 32 please oh what's that hmm. So this is a female shoe that was in that um, incredible little time capsule from the 1930s. Um, yeah, but the stories that shoe could tell, we'll never know, but uh, there you go. Slide 33, please. This is an intriguing bottle. It, it states on it embossed in the glass, a fluid beef cordial. Johnson's fluid beef cordial. So what is fluid beef? Hmm, certainly sounds, uh, sounds uh, interesting. So, 
in 19, uh, I guess it was 1870s, a Scotsman, uh, John Johnston, he created, he, he took beef, basically, he steamed it, he removed the uh, albumin, al albumin, albumin, which is produced by the liver to help blood flow, he, he, he removed that, then he mixed it with lean beef, then he dried it to a powder, then he added beef extract, and a fluid, and then he created, next slide please, we'll see what he, what did he create? Aha, Bovril, there you go, Bovril, funny story. I talked to my uncle, he's 98, he's, not, he's 98 today, this is his birthday, I was over there last night, I said, talking about Bovril, and he said to me, he goes, you know, I remember I was nine years old in Edinburgh, Scotland, and there was a huge billboard, and it was all blue, and it was a guy in his pajamas on top of, he's telling the story, he's on top of a Bovril bottle. I said, wow, you know what? That is exactly the ad that I pulled from the internet to uh, show Bovril, but he remembers seeing this as a child uh, on a billboard in, in Scotland. Um, but there you go, it's Bovril. And how did Bovril get its name? Well, um, Johnson took the, the Latin word bow for ox or bovine. And at the time there was a popular novel called The Coming Race. It was by Edward uh, bulwer Lighton, and the novel called The Coming Race. And in this book was a mysterious life force centered around a mysterious life force. So he just added a uh, bow to Vril. The life force was called Vril for some reason. So he just added bow to Vril and yeah, came up with the name uh, Bovril. There you go. You can think of that lovely story next time you make your soups, <laughs> your soups and stews. Um, here we have the classic, right? The, uh, the tin enamelware. Um, again, from the uh, 1920s, 30s time capsule. I mean, everybody had this in their house, right? Working people, you had your tin and enamelware, you had your, your cheap spoons, of course. Um, still not sure how you would use the right spoon to drink soup. It seems to be missing a portion of it. So. <laughs> but there you go. That was in the, um, that was in that little time capsule there. Slide 36, please. Another series of miscellaneous bottles, uh, poison bottle, the blue on the left. Uh, there's HP sauce condensed. You added water to it to make it, you know, uh, HP sauce. On your far right is a beautiful Art Deco shaped uh, makeup bottle. Now that little, see a little green bottle, second from the left, that has embossed on it, Majors uh, Cement New York. And what it is, is um, nearly, I guess, 1890s, a New Yorker, Alphonse Major, he developed a line of cements and glues. And it was, so, it was so popular, it was wildly popular. He could not keep up with demand. He sold a ton of this major cement and it fixed everything from leather, china, glass. And uh, in one ad, it was apparently good for tipping billiard cues. Not sure why you'd wanna tip your billiard cue, but I guess to get, if it got chipped, you could dip it in major's uh, cement. So back in the day, Alphonse was, he was actually spending 5,000 US a month on advertising. 5,000 US a month on advertising. And in today's dollars, $5,000 US in 1900, 1905 is 162,000 dollars today. So that just shows you how popular these cements were. He was spending 162,000 a month on advertising. The product was used up to the 1950s actually. Um, yeah, but again, uh, just a cool little story, right? That just a little bottle can tell. Um, it just shows you that any and every artifact has a story to tell. It's up to you, right, <laughs> to glean it from it, to, 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 to pull it from it, or at least a portion, a portion of the story. Um, if we could have slide 37. Oh, what's this now? So we thought, oh, finally, Lundy's Lane, the battle showed up. This is great. Look at this cannonball. And then we go to slide 38, and we <laughs> cleaned it. No, two things. Obviously, you can see there was a, a, a clasp put into the top of it. There's a deep groove through the middle of it. And this quote unquote cannonball comes from the dead center of the brick chimney of the web theater. So either it was a slow moving cannonball that went in the chimney of the web theater in 1923, or what it turned out to be, it's a counterweight for the chimney system of the web theater. So got excited there for a moment, but uh, yeah, no go. We have slide 39. This is pretty cool. This is, uh, well, it's obvious what it is. It's a Mickey Mouse uh, children's cup. And uh, yeah, this is from when, you know, Mickey Mouse was more of a, more of a rat, right? He's, you can see his eyes and this is pre, this was pre the makeover for Mickey Mouse. Um, but yeah, some child drank from that at breakfast. 
uh, that child may still be with us today. Um, but isn't that the coolest thing? Mickey Mouse in his uh, in his early form, in his early days. We have slide 40. Ah, oh, this is, I love this. Love this photo. Love it, love it, love it. This is um, some of the contents of that little time capsule there from the, so you've got, you've got a beef bone there. You've got um, a pig uh, mandible, so to speak. You've got sort of dinnerware, ironstone or whiteware, um, some with embossed designs on it on the rims. You've got a crock lid. Look at that white bottle. That screams, isn't that Art Deco? Look at that design. That's, it, I mean, it ba basically looks like the, um, some of the architecture from the day uh, used in a bottle. You've got some ink wells, medicine bottles, preserve bottles. There's a uh, broken Niagara Falls uh, dairy uh, milk bottle in the back there. Um, but you can see again that uh, the cow bone at the front. You can see how somebody has sawed, used a saw, and just uh, separated that, cut that bone in half, literally. Um, slide 41. So here are the saw marks. And you can tell that they are machine sawed. Somebody used an electric saw to cut this uh, cow bone because of those um, beautiful, consistent lines, right? That's an electric saw going through the bone. Now, if it had been hand sawed, you would have uh, the saw marks would not appear, appear that consistent. They'd be um, various spaces between the cut marks that would show evidence of a, of a hand saw, but this was a machine uh, sawed cow bone. Slide 42. So, hmm, mystery, mystery mollusk, mystery mollusk. Ooh, what's a mystery mollusk? So let's see, Josh was again, doing the trench work. And this mollusk pops up, and I believe it was in the trench with the 1920s, 30s, um, it was in the same trench. Uh, but it appeared to have come from um, a, um, I thought it, it'd come from undisturbed sand. I thought it, it'd come from sand that had never been, you know, touched by, by, by humans. And then I started thinking, was there such a, um, a, a, a clam in existence, mollusk existence during Lake Warren? Um, so I'm kind of still, I'm leaning back to that, that clam was somebody's yeah, that mollusk was somebody's dinner in the 1920s or 30s. But for a moment, it threw me off where, where it came from. It probably fell out of the wall, right? Out of the historic the clays, the disturbed clays, or stuck to the shovel from back to the time capsule. But it just threw me for a loop where it originated from. And I thought, hey, could this be from Lake, uh, literally from Lake Warren? Um, but it looks certainly like somebody's uh, dinner from the, uh, yeah. Uh, clam dinner from 1920s, 1930s. And, uh, there we go. Look at this. This is pretty cool. So we had a water well. We had a cistern. Um, back in 1840s, 1860s, if you wanted to bring water to your home, I know in Welland, of course, it, it occurred five or six areas where these they used these wood pipes. They actually took a tree. They literally bored the tree out or... They made a series of staves and banded them together to make a wood water line. I mean, talk about, imagine drinking the water from a wood water line. I mean, so, and you, you relied on gravity to get the water to you, right? There was no pumps or any of that, but this is a remnant of a wood water line that um, popped up in uh, digging of the east uh, or of the west wall of what will become the, uh, the exchange. Yeah, uh, pretty, pretty cool. Um, Pretty cool artifact, pretty cool find. And there we are, the future of, uh, now you can see, actually this photo shows it well. You can see how the west wall on Main Street, how the building is backed off a bit from, from Main Street. So you still have a chunk of land there where the Kick Hotel sat that is undisturbed um, for, for the future. That's a, a, a pretty cool illustration of that. Um, yeah, I just want to thank everybody for such a successful project, you know, from an archaeological point of view. Um, first of all, I want to thank Adam and Jordan and Matthew and Joel from the Mississauga, the Credit First Nation. Uh, these guys were with me each time I was down there, and what a great bunch of guys. I mean, just awesome representatives of their nation, just uh, the coolest guys to work with. 
and they were there with me through the winter. Uh, I also want to thank the construction crew. Um, there was Josh, Matt, another Josh and Sam and Tom and Woody. Now, you can imagine when an, archeolo an archeologist shows up with a construction crew, right? It can go both ways. It can go, why are you here? We don't want you here. We're not gonna help you out to, hey man, we're so excited. Let's, let's, let's do this, right? And luckily these guys were in that category. Let's, they were pumped, they were primed, they were ready to go. They were aware of some of the history. They wanted to help out. They were, they were in there like, yeah, it was, it was really awesome. I've had the other one, I've had the other way as well. And typically I can have, they'll be my best friends by the end of the project, but these guys were great. These were, they were genuinely interested in it and they really, uh, really made the job easy and really helped me out. Um, and I wanna thank my colleague, Brian uh, Nari. He did an incredible research. The guy is like top in the province for research. And of course my, the project manager, Dave Robertson and uh, got a bunch of other ASI colleagues that were involved in it, but just a great job overall. And I want to thank Jody, my buddy, Jody Pula. He's uh, literally the head bottle washer. Um, he dug with me as a kid and uh, yeah, he cleaned up the bottles nicely and did some research for me. So I really appreciate that. And of course, I want to thank DTHA, AH, the architects of this beautiful structure and Garitano brothers, the Charlton group, they all, it just, it was seamless, really. It was a pleasure really to work uh, down there in Lundy's Lane. Um, yeah, so there we have it, the archaeology of the Niagara Falls Exchange. The Battle of Lundy's Lane never showed up. But we did find, uh, you know, evidence associated with life on Main Street over the centuries. And yes, it would have been great to find that cannonball or a rusky musket. But for me personally, as an archaeologist, I get such a kick, well, kick hotel, pardon the pun, out of finding buried structures and just, you know, those everyday mundane items, really, that, um, that, that just bring the life, right? They add flesh to the bones, right? It, people live their life here. They, they, they used everything that we use to, today, just a, it appeared different, it was made different. I mean, there's a lot of stories that we'll never t tell that will be uh, uh, of people that use this property, but what we did recover, um, it really brings you know, the land to life, right? It really tells a bunch of stories. It's, it's very cool, it's very cool. And that's what archaeology does, right? It brings uh, those stories and lives from those cold, empty artifacts. It's just, it's just awesome. Um, but again, it's, uh, it's just a pleasure to do this job. It's a pleasure to work here. And I want to thank everybody for making it so great. Um, so thank you very much. That's my presentation. And uh, there you go. If you have any questions, I'd love to answer them. Thank you, Doug. That was fantastic. We really appreciate you taking the time um, to go through that in detail and, and really showing the excitement that you have uh, for what you find under the ground that some people might dismiss as, as just another bottle or just another thing. It's, uh, um, there's some really neat stories that can be told down there. So we really, really appreciate you taking that. Uh, we've had a few questions in. All right. um, I'm gonna sort of start at the top and uh, actually it's our lead architect is actually the first question. Okay, it okay. might be more to me, but I'm gonna sort of start with you in some ways. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what's the life cycle of these artifacts? Just so people at home know, you know, we hired you out to do the dig. Um, like I said, it's still sort of in some ways early days or, or, or am I wrong in that? Or how, you know, what's the life cycle of uh, an artifact and, and uh, where does it go from here? Right, so let's basically start with a generalized artifact. So say dad drinks a beer, dad throws the beer out in the backyard in a hole. I find the beer bottle. I clean the beer bottle, document the beer bottle, we include the beer bottle photographs, um, you know, talk about the beer bottle like we did here or in a future report. And then where does dad's beer bottle go from the, that's the big question, right? Where does dad's beer bottle end up? So um, it could be several places really. It can end up at starting in within the township, within the, within the city confines with literally from the museum to um, there's a artifact depository in London where a lot of uh, the province's artifacts go after re and are available for future research. But yeah, that's a great story, a great question. They obviously end up um, at an institution somewhere ultimately, ultimately. Uh, we like to see them stay locally or they're uh, of course documented and reported on and then um, possibly end up at the uh, depository in, um, in the London area. And I think, um, talking about expanding that but yeah so that's basically the uh, the life cycle of that of that artifact 
Yeah, that's a museum. It's, it's funny from the museum perspective. And again, you know, I'm not the curator, so it's more of a Suzanne question. But, you know, will they end up at the museum? We might, you know, we might take them in. We might not. Depends on which dig. And we haven't even right. come to that stage to talk about that. Right. It's really interesting because we get archaeologists approaching us for to be a repository. And, you know, sometimes the collection is tells a great story. And sometimes, you know what, it doesn't. Some right. archaeologists tell us because it doesn't tell us a great story that it, that's the story. And uh, when we take things in, we take them in forever. So again, it's an ongoing, you know, um, um, challenge for museums because the, the collection has, you know, the, the artifact. This is a nice tight collection though. That's in some ways makes life a little bit easier for museums to think about having to keep them forever and ever and ever. Um, and, uh, um, you know, there, there's talks, you know, some of the questions were whether we display them way too early for us. We didn't, you know, until Doug does report and we look, to be honest, until I saw his, uh, presentation. We didn't even know what he really had. I had seen a few things. I actually rooted around some of the 1980s vintage clothing, seeing if there's anything really good there. Um, <laughs> I got a good, so good not, pair not of pants from it. Was it. It wasn't really that interesting, was it? It wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't that fun vintage clothing that, you, that I was hoping <laughs> no, to see there. It was right. a little that's bit right. ratty in that, that, that hole that they, they, they dug it in there. But, uh, you know, long story short, it's probably early days for us to determine where this, these artifacts lie. Um, I'm not going to speak on behalf of the curator whether they come to the museum. I think there's a good likelihood of that. I think the Kick Hotel connection is great, um, and it's a story that we already have artifacts to tell. Um, but this this continues that story, and uh, um, you know, long story short, it's a maybe 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 they will. As for being displayed, you know, that that's, that's also too hard to sort of say. Um, artifacts on their own, you know, as a group, sometimes work. Sometimes they don't just depend right. on the exhibition. You know, I just saw a great question here from Joel. And I, that would be off, awesome to have a little area near the front door, say, of it entering the new structure. And there's a, a little showcase of, hey, this came from this property. You know, this is. Uh, so the architect is we're listening on. We don't have a little display case set up in the. In the <laughs> there is nothing like that set up yet. So maybe that's another months. way to go at that. Yeah, that would be an awesome thing to do. Yeah, for yes, sure. Yes. Beautiful. There's a couple of different ways we can go at that. Um, there, there's two other, well, one I'll, I'll take care of. Uh, one of the questions was about Pier Street being misspelled. Uh, in fact, Pier Street, uh, I think I think you have it right at P-E-R. I don't know, it's like- I saw, yeah, I saw two spellings in the uh, course of my oh, okay. time machine travels, yeah. Yeah, but 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 of course it is Pier, P-E-E-R, um, generally tied into the family of peers in the area, so. Um, I don't know okay, which one you go. use, but uh, somebody was asking. Right. Yeah, I did see two. I, I think I chose the wrong one. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. um, the other one was a question about Indigenous artifacts. And again, that's uh, one of those things. I think there's two things. I think, I can't remember who was your lead from ASI. I forget his name because I was working with a couple, uh, two different projects with uh, your firm. So I forget the name of who did the stage two dig. And he was determined that, that the Kicks Hotel Foundations, and again, we found the cistern and we found the... Uh, the well, but really he, he thought for sure we were going to find the foundations. That's one thing we really didn't find in the actual And you know what too, and, itself. yeah, and you can see from that diagram that it is offset a bit, right? There's still mm -hmm. the potential in the future, yeah. That's yeah. right. But the, the one question was, and so that was one thing that I think we found was surprising we didn't find, but the other was what somebody was asked about Indigenous artifacts, and, and I right. don't believe you so, found any, right? No, so here's the scoop on that. Now, I, my job is basically the analysis of stone tools right and the debris when you create stone tools and uh since i was a child my eye is always on the ground looking for stone tools and the debris created when making stone tools it is my passion it is my job it is my i love it love it love it to hold a tool that was made two thousand years ago three thousand years ago nine thousand years ago that tool was made for a reason that tool Light, you lived or died on the success of making that stone tool, right? You were going to feed yourself, you're going to feed your family, but you had to produce a great, great tool to provide that food for. Now, any job I'm on, the number one thing that is deeply seared into my mind is the search and looking for this material, right? Whether it's Onondaga shirt that was used or Haldeman shirt or any of the shirt groups that were found in Ontario. I have some of the craziest stories of meeting uh, clients out where work is going to begin, either whether it's stage one or stage two, which involves no digging. They will tell me there are no stone tools on this. Pro There's nothing, no remnants of, right? They're telling me this as they know. Twice, I've looked at their feet while they're talking to me. And one gentleman was standing on a projectile point. 
another gentleman was standing on a net sinker. So I'm constantly, constantly on the search for, uh, I'm, I'm glad that was brought up. So in the, uh, in the course of this work, um, not only the First Nations participation in the battle itself, but of course, that pre, you know, 230 years ago, that, that thousands of years of occupation, well, sadly, the topsoil has been removed, right? Where you're going to find the majority of that sort of artifact, it's whether it's the parking lot the or the building or the, you know, oh, it's time to put in the parking lot, remove all the, that topsoil is valuable, removed, right? So sadly, uh, no, no, there was uh, zero evidence as much as I was hoping and, and praying there was, because uh, again, it's my passion, those stone tools, that, that material you create when you make that stone tool. But the property was so blitzed and that all important topsoil um, taken away that, uh, yeah, the results for that type of artifact um, currently stand at, uh, sadly, at zero. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, anyways, thank you very much, Doug. It was, it was fascinating to talk to you and hear about what happened there. And, and uh, uh, the work continues on this property. And uh, uh, we'll see where those artifacts land and where they, they get to. And, uh, uh, you know, maybe if there's some interpretation need in the future, we'll be, we'll be, we'll be looking at the video first, but maybe reaching out to sort of look, look uh, uh, to talk to you a bit more. About yeah, no, that's so. fantastic. I, I love doing this type of presentation. I love talking to the public. Anybody has any questions, you can hunt me down and find me <laughs> or any, anything to show or help identify. I have people constantly contacting me. Hey, I found uh, an arrowhead or projectile point in my backyard. Hey, can you, you know, I love that. And please feel free. Any, any question on any subject related to archaeology, please. I'd love to, uh, love to answer. Well, th thank you very much, Doug. I really appreciate it. I think everybody uh, enjoy it. They, they, they could not, not, not enjoy it. Um, it was a great talk and a great, great way to walk through this property and, uh, you know, 11,000 years of history, even though we didn't, uh, didn't uncover the first, uh, you know, 10,000 years or 10,750 years of it. So uh, really great, really appreciate it. Thanks everybody thank so for much. joining us um, and uh, participating now at the museum uh, Thursday nights. Uh, check out our website and our social media for lots of other great things that we do on Thursdays. We've got a full slate of uh, more programs every Thursday night. So check that out and follow the museums, follow the exchange, follow the culture and follow the farmer's market for what's going on both on this property and, and in other places across the city. So um, that's it for us for tonight. Uh, take care and uh, have a great evening. Thank Thanks, you. everybody. Thank you. Take care. Good night.